Now, I would like to welcome all of you to the second day of the uh, conference. And today, um, it's a long program, and we will start it uh, right now, in a minute. And then, uh, throughout the program, uh, we will finish at around 8 o'clock. Um, uh, this adjustment is based on the time differences between the countries. And you might you may ask why we are having the conference till uh, 8 p.m. Uh, and uh, the speakers, the keynote speakers, very uh, and is from USA, and there's a eight hour difference, and uh, probably they are sleeping right now. And when they wake, wake up, um, we will ask them to join us. And <clears throat> I think. Uh, I will just uh, continue with the program. The very first speaker is uh, Risat Azim, and we uh, we just found out that he, he lives in Canada, in west of Alberta. So probably he's sleeping at the moment. But he sent us the his video. So we are just going to run his video at the moment. And uh, if you have any questions. Uh, we will just record them and uh, uh, ask him later on. And so there will be some asynchron uh, uh, question and answer system. Welcome, everyone. I am Muhammad Riyasat Azim. And it's my pleasure to present in front of you my research um, as part of the Istanbul Bridge Conference. First of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee for giving me the opportunity to present my work. Unfortunately, due to some unavoidable circumstances, I will not be able to present it live. So you are listening and seeing the recorded version of my presentation. Today, I will be talking about uh, damage identification of railway bridges using analysis of strain data. Now, railway bridges are a critical component of any railway infrastructure system. And based on data from various parts of the world, for example, Canada, USA, India, uh, we can see the majority of the bridges are getting old and or very old. And some of them have even exceeded their design lifespan. In addition to aging related issues, these railway bridges are facing various other problems and therefore they require specific maintenance strategies. The problems that rail these railway bridges face are caused by the various incidences as reported in the literature. These incidences include derailed trains striking the bridge elements, uh, damage caused by fire, fatty corrosion and other environmental effects, loosening of connection over time, and also effect of scouring. These incidences cause different types of damage to the bridge, and uh, these um, include damage to structural elements, which involve loss of stiffness and loss of thickness or size of elements, and also more seriously, uh, failure of structural member altogether to carry the load. Another type of problem that is very important and very critical to address is the problem in boundary condition, which involves change in the boundary restraint or behavior of the support. For example, uh, support is intended to be roller, but it behaves as a pinned support. And also displacement or movement of support, which is probably due to scouring. Now, there are various uh, methods uh, for health monitoring uh, have been developed by uh, researchers around the world, and all of them have their own advantage and disadvantages. So when I started doing my PhD, the goal of my PhD research was to develop a damage detection framework, which applies to railway bridges, with the main focus on developing data-driven methods. And the advantage of data-driven method is it doesn't require physical information of the bridge, or nor does it require finite element modeling of the bridge. Therefore, it simplifies the implementation of the procedure uh, application. And uh, the method that I developed 
could be should be able to should be utilized for long term continuous monitoring should be effective in detecting locating and relatively quantifying damage at the same time it should be robust enough to operational variability and measurement noise um, and the ultimate overall goal is to uh, present this as a framework which can assist on site inspection and maintenance strategies so the damage reduction framework that I propose can be seen in this flowchart. So we have the existing bridge or a new bridge, which can be termed as baseline bridge. And from that baseline bridge, data acquisition system is installed to collect strain data in this case. And as the condition of the bridge changes and the condition becomes unknown, data is continuously collected. In this case, by data, I mean strain data is collected after passage of train. So once we once the data is available, the different statistical analysis can be performed, which are main, for example, mean standard deviation, coefficient of variation, principal component analysis, and so on. Once those statistical analysis are performed, using those statistical analysis, I have developed different damage features from which can be extracted from structural elements. And these damage features will provide information of damage, its location and its relative severity. So the first theory that I will present is a very simple one, which is basically analysis of mean and standard deviation. Now, the first reason why I picked strain is Strain monitoring is recognized as the most common and inexpensive way to monitor condition of bridges. And the second reason is strain is very sensitive to local, localized damage and simple statistical tools can be employed to assess such sensitivity. So for example, after a passage of train over a bridge, we get strain response matrix ST as shown in here. Here, capital NS, here this NS is the number of sensor, which in this case is the number of strain gauges in the bridge. And small n is the total number of data points from each sensor. So from this matrix, main matrix and standard deviation matrix are constructed. So once we have main matrix and standard deviation matrix from the baseline bridge and the unknown condition bridge, the change in mean matrix and uh, change in standard deviation matrix are computed as in terms of percentage, which are denoted as delta M and delta D. So those these delta M and delta D are used uh, in this manner, are summed up over a square root to create a damage feature, DF, as seen here. And this DF basically combines the information of mean and standard deviation. Now, since uh, damage changes the mean and standard deviation of the strain data, use, or by observing the change in this DF value, damage can be located, uh, detected. The second theory, which I developed as part of my PhD, was analysis of coefficient of variation. So we take the same strain response matrix, but this time we normalize the data. With, with respect to maximum strain value from that matrix. And from that normalized strain matrix, coefficient of variation matrix is constructed, the components of which can be, are computed using this equation. Now, once we, we have the coefficient of variation matrix for the baseline bridge and the unknown condition bridge, damage can be tracked by just observing the change in that matrix, because again, structural change causes change in the components of covariance matrix. So the difference matrix is in this case is the damage sensitive feature, which is basically the, the absolute difference of uh, coefficient of variation matrix from baseline to unknown state bridge. The third theory that I've developed employs principal component analysis. So from the strain matrix, we, call, we construct the coefficient of variation matrix. 
But this time, this coefficient of variation matrix is used to calculate principal components, which are basically eigenvectors. Now, the main reason why principal component analysis is used because it is a very effective data recursion tool. For example, if we have 20 sensors in the bridge, the coefficient of variation matrix will be 20 by 20. But the advantage of computing principal components are it is a very effective data regression tool and therefore we can uh, reduce the dimension of the matrix. In my research, I found that out of the 20, that 20 by 20 principal component, uh, 20 by 20 coefficient of variation matrix will give 20 principal components. But in my research, I found out of those 20, only the first two uh, principal components is enough to account for 90% in uh, change in variance. So instead of 20 by 20 matrix, I, uh, I ended up with 2 by 20 matrix or 20 by 2 matrix with two principal components. Now these principal components are orthogonal vectors. Therefore, they can be plotted in a two dimensional plot, as you can see here. And because these are orthogonal, each point, the distance from the origin can be calculated by simple geometric equation, which is square root of some square. Uh, once we have this distance for the baseline bridge and the unknown state bridge, a damage indicator or damage feature is proposed, which, is, which basically observes the change in this distance from the baseline bridge to the unknown state bridge. As you can see here in this equation. So these are the, the theories that I have developed to, uh, to detect damage using strain. Now I will show you an application of these theories through finite element analysis of a truss bridge. You can see the bridge here and it's a 33 meter long bridge. Uh, I used CSI bridge 2014 software to model and analyze this bridge, and that analysis was performed in MATLAB. Now, in order to simplify the uh, calculation, only one side of that bridge is considered for monitoring, and that side had 20 elements, but it is unrealistic to monitor uh, all the elements with strain gauges. So I randomly picked 12 elements for strain monitoring, which are shown by double lines. Now from these elements, which are marked with double lines, strain data, strain time history responses are obtained after each passage of a train. And typical responses are shown here and here, which is element 32 and 44, which are these and this. Now, once we have data, a very important step is to calculate threshold damage indicator. This threshold damage indicator corresponds to damage indicator which is not due to damage but due to change in operational response and effect of measurement noise in other other way uh, other words this threshold damage indicator takes into account the effect of operational variability and measurement noise and therefore any value exceeding that threshold value is due to structural change in order to calculate threshold values uh, I took the undamaged bridge and then two different trains were passed over that bridge. Those two trains have different operational load and speed. And once we, once I have the two responses, I added artificial noise in terms of random noise by 5% artificial random noise and simulated those data for over 200 times and calculated damage indicators using all three methods. And after I have uh, damage indicators for all those 200 simulations, I picked the damage uh, threshold damage indicator as 99% with 99% confidence interval. So once I have the threshold damage indicators, part of the change in structural response is fact. So here I will present a few examples. 
For, for example, using the mean and standard deviation analysis, uh, you can, here is an example of mean and standard deviation analysis for a damaged element, element 33. Uh, in this case, the element 33 is simulated to be damaged by 5%, 10%, and 20% stiffness loss. And by baseline, I mean undamaged bridge. And here, the dotted line is the threshold damage indicator using the philosophy that I present just before. So what I can, what you can see is in the baseline case, the um, damage features from the sen uh, strain gauges are all below the threshold. But as the element 33 damage got damaged, the uh, damage feature for element 33 shoot up above the threshold value and it continues to increase as the severity of the damage increased. Therefore, uh, we can see that damage is detected and located as well as its as severity can be assessed. Same thing using the coefficient of variation analysis, which is basically a difference matrix. Therefore, you can see it as a uh, matrix uh, mat in a matrix form. So here I present the example when the same element is 20% uh, damaged. And you can see the coefficient change in coefficients for element 33 are much higher uh, based on the color code compared to others. Similarly, with PCA, we, we, we, we can see uh, that for element 33, the damage indicator for damaged element 33 uh, are tracked very well. And it's able to detect, locate, and uh, relatively assess the severity of the damage. Now, the one of the benefit of using this method is uh, even if the more, some of the elements are not monitored using strain data, we can still detect damage. For example, in this case, element um, 35 is not uh, monitored with strain gauge, but it is damaged. However, when we do the mean and standard deviation analysis, we can see that damage is detected in terms of its adjacent vertical element, element 34, and its severity is also relatively identified, um, assessed. Similarly, for example, element 20, if element 20 is not monitored, its effect is uh, the damage is detected in terms of its uh, closest uh, elements, which are 21, 22, 23, which is part of the same bottom garden. So we can see the uh, coefficients, the change in coefficients for those three elements are higher compared to others. And finally, for example, um, for principal component analysis, you can see if the element 20 is damaged, its effect is shown in terms of element 21. So the benefit of using this method is even if the damaged element is not monitored using strain data, uh, we can still get information of damage and its severity in terms of adjacent monitored elements. Here is another example, which is a change, uh, which is which shows the effect of change in support behavior. So in this case, uh, the right support was supposed to be a roller, but it behaves a rotational strain. Uh, sorry, we, we have long, longitudinal restraint, therefore it becomes a pin support. Now, when that thing happens, it affects the entire structure. It is a very severe damage. And when we analyze the mean and standard deviation, we can see the um, damage is detected in terms of the, all the bottom cord elements, which are monitored, like 24, 23, 22, 21. And the reason why these elements are shown is because uh, when you when a roller support becomes fixed support uh, pin support, it adds a longitudinal restraint which which is collinear with the bottom guard with the bottom garter. Therefore, the majority of the effect is uh, change in uh, majority of the effect is concentrated in the bottom garters, and there that's why we see. The bottom uh, strain, the effect of, of strain, change in strain in the bottom gutter is the highest, our highest. Therefore, we can still identify the dam that we can still identify that it's a very severe damage, which affects the entire bottom gutter. Same thing, we can see 
the in the coefficient of variation analysis you can see element 24 23 22 21 have the higher damage uh, changing coefficients and similarly with pca we can see uh, the same thing 24 23 21 22 So the, these three examples demonstrate the versatility of the methods that I have uh, developed. It can be used to detect uh, change in stiffness in elements which are monitored. And in that case, it will identify, locate, and assess the severity of the damage in terms of that element. And when the damage is in an element where, which is not monitored, we can still get information in terms of adjacent element and we can also identify change in support behavior uh, which is a very severe damage in terms of uh, which elements are mostly affected therefore um, the summary of this research is i have developed a data-driven operational strain response based damage reduction methods which apply to railway bridge and uh, these are validated through numerical analysis and it these three examples show that the methods are capable of identifying, locating, and assessing relative severity of damage. And uh, finally, it serves the purpose, which is the main purpose of my research, which is um, which should be able to help on-site inspection strategy. Now, in order to uh, obtain more information, for example, to pinpoint the location of damage for which strain data is not available, uh, other methods, for example, acceleration-based methods, which are available in literature, can be uh, complement, uh, can be considered together with this method. Thank you very much for your hearing. And um, I know I am not doing a live presentation, but if you have any questions, you are welcome to contact me in, uh, to my email address. Thank you for your hearing and. Uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you very much. Welcome everyone. I am uh, uh, Well, so if you, if you will have any questions, yes, we can transfer the question to uh, Dr. Azim and uh, or you can just direct email to him. And uh, the next speaker is uh, Abdullah Rahman. And uh, Abdullah, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, and you can, if you are ready, you can start sharing your screen and... and... Uh, okay. And they are, he's told me that host is disabled, the screen sharing, okay. I'm fine now. Can you try again? Yes, perfect. I just tried, I think it should be okay now. Uh, just a second. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Abdullah Rahman. Uh, I will be presenting my uh, master thesis uh, presentation. Uh, it's about this. Uh, we made a sensitivity analysis for, uh, for high speed railway bridges. Considering rail structure interaction, uh, I've been supervised by Professor Dr. Altener. Uh, let me just start with an introduction, brief introduction, what it is rail structure interaction. Uh, mainly uh, in the near future, we started to use an extremely high speed uh, trains. And these trains, uh, they are using a special type of rails. It's, it's called the CWR, the continuous welded rail. The continuous welded rail, it's different from the conventional rail where th there is no gaps between the rails for ex thermal expansion. It's always continuously welded. So it's, it forms like a uh, one body without any uh, gaps between the rails. Since it's continuous, uh, the rail, it's continuous uh, under thermal loads, it, it cannot uh, extract under uh, temperaturized or contract under temperature fall. Due to this phenomena, there will be some stresses uh, build up within the rail. Now that track, uh, uh, track structure interaction becomes because 
uh, when you are putting this rail uh, and you want and you have already built the bridge and then you you have constructed your uh, your rail your bridge structure uh, has a longitudinal stiffness and it could move actually if it's made of concrete or steel under thermal loads it will contract or expand so this movement of the bridge will induce some stresses on your track this is one of the the track uh, track structure interaction one of the results of this uh, phenomena the second thing that you have a horizontal force generated from your train uh, under acceleration forces when the train is trying to start movement it will generate some uh, horizontal forces on the track which will be transmitted to the bridge structure the bridge structure under this horizontal force will start to move or to to make some displacement the same case of for the braking loads when your train is trying to stop or deaccelerate while it's passing over the bridge it will also create some horizontal forces which will, which will be transmitted through the rail to the substructure which is your bridge and yeah, under these horizontal loads your bridge will start to make some displacements this displacement will induce another stresses on your rail now there there are two terms to be considered why we are talking about rail structure interaction rail stresses and displacements now rail stresses uh, will deal with the rail itself for example if there is a high excessive tensile forces or tensile stresses your track will rupture under tensile forces if there is a compression forces or compression stresses there is the possibility of your track could buckle under high compression forces. Now the displacements deal with the ballast bed. My analysis are all, all valid for only the ballast bed. I am not dealing with the directly fastened uh, tracks. Ballast bed is made of ballast and ballast under certain de deformation, it will become unstable because you know it's not a, a continuum material. It's just uh, particles. Uh, they are constellated uh, over the bridge and if you impose a big de deformation this ballast will become unstable and this instability will will, will cause will not support your rail and under this uh, you will uh, the stability uh, the track will lose stability so that's why i want to give a brief introduction about what it is mean uh, uh, track structure interaction now if if i continue with my introduction uh, I've talked about interaction definition, then I tried to describe what does mean that additional stresses. Now in track structure interaction, we don't deal with the stresses within the track. We deal with the additional stresses caused by the bridge movement. I don't deal with the, there is some build up stresses within the track due to uh, vertical movement of the train over the track, due to wearing corrosion, and uh, I'm not dealing with it. Also, the design codes doesn't deal with this, uh, with this type of stresses. They only deal with the additional stresses. Uh, in my study, we have made a sensitivity analysis to, dis uh, to discover which parameters affecting the uh, rail stresses. For example, the bridge, uh, this is a, a schematic showing the bridge uh, while a train is passing over it. If we are talking about a numerical modeling of the bridge, if you can see here, here we have the track and the track it's always continuous over the bridge. Now you may have on, you may not have an expansion device. So I only, this is for only an illustrating purposes. Now you can see that this is the bridge deck. The bridge deck is connected, is connected to the track by the ballast bed where in numerical methods, we uh, use a nonlinear uh, link element here by, to couple uh, to couple the track with the bridge deck now the bridge deck here it has certain uh, mechanical properties for example it's uh, bending uh, stiffness it's uh, maximum permissible uh, expansion length or the expansion length in this case it's from here to here the supporting conditions uh, of the bridge and the uh, the longitudinal stiffness of your bridge. Now, in all of my numerical method, as, as shown here, I've used a spring element to reflect the longitudinal stiffness of the bridge. I will talk uh, about them in a minute. Now, as you can see, 
the train will transfer the horizontal forces through the ballast bed to the to the bridge deck and then to your bridge substructure uh, and it will transfer the, uh, the vertical loads through the ballast bed to the to uh, to the bridge deck uh, structure now if we talk about the coupling material which is we are using the ballast the ballast is a nonlinear material its behavior is affected by the uh, vertical loads what does it mean that uh, the ballast horizontal stiffness is affected by the vertical loads where uh, which mean that if you have the unloaded case for example you have the ballast you have the bridge and you have the ballast and the track but you don't have the train passing over it the ballast stiffness and the yielding displacement here will be different if the if you have a train over your, your bridge because uh, the train will cause some uh, vertical loads this vertical loads would make some confinement this confinement will increase uh, the horizontal stiffness of your ballast and this will increase the force transmitted from uh, to track to the to your uh, bridge substructure actually the term is interaction is exists due to coupling between uh, the track and the bridge substructure through your ballast bed now bridge if uh, any bridge structure it will move under a thermal effect now if your bridge is moving under thermal effect uh, your track is continuous and it's not moving under thermal effect because it's continuous your bridge is extracting or expanding so this movement will induce an extra stress to your rail again traffic passing over the bridge uh, your train will induce some bending moments on the bridge. This movement of the deck due to flexure or due to bending stiffness, this will induce an additional stresses on your track. You should check, the, you should check them. Also, the braking and the acceleration forces, are, as I've mentioned before, it will induce uh, horizontal forces which will cause your bridge to move. This, the bridge movement will induce an extra stresses on your track. Now, if I uh, I, if I will talk, as I mentioned before, there is a rail has already stresses not related to interaction, residual stresses due to production, bending of the rail under train vertical loads. We don't consider this one uh, in the track uh, structure interaction. We consider the whole display, bending displacement of the bridge, not the bending between the two fasteners. Temperature uh, change within the rail, we don't consider it. Now, if I continue, you can see we all we all familiar with the 92 MPa tension limit and the 72 MPa compression limit. But if you take a look, you know that the track is tensile strength is about 900 MPa. Uh, here, I just want to illustrate that why we have the 72 MPa is because uh, they only allow for six, 630 MPa as a tensile stress. Now it will be dropped due to uh, corrosion to 470. You, we have already temperature change in the rail. It's fixed for around 192 MPa. Then we have the residual stress coming from the manufacturing. Uh, and the remaining part, this we call the additional stresses will become the 92. The same case is for the compression where the limit is uh, 290. They are giving around the safe margin in according to the design speed, then temperature changes within the rail, then the additional pressure remain to due to vehicle or track, which interaction will be around 72 megapascals. Now, if we are talking about the design standards, they will be there. There are two, uh, two mainly design standards, the UIC code and the Euro code. They are much the same. The, the only di one difference between them is the relative displacement between track and bridge. In the UIC, it's allowed about around four millimeter. In Euro code, it's around five millimeters. This is the only one difference between them, as you can see here. There, there is some American recommendations, but uh, mostly they are using the European standard in, the, in their projects for high-speed railway bridges. Now, uh, I will mention that whenever, when I started my study, I, you, you need to uh, validate your uh, 
how can I say, you, you need to validate your number, your model. And uh, the UIC gave some benchmarks or case studies. If you perform it and the difference is less than 5% or 10%, it's okay. You can use that, uh, the modeling process that you have used. So I made uh, this one, uh, I made this uh, studies and this validation. Then I uh, take a look on their uh, results and I measured the difference. In the, in the very beginning of my study, then I continue my sensitivity analysis. Now you can see, as you can see, the differences are less than 10%, which is okay with UIC. After that, I started my, my study. This study is it's focused on the effects or the parameters affecting the track bridge interaction. This study is meant to, uh, is performed on one span single dex bridges, four spans starts from 20, up to 90 meters. This study applicable for continuous bridges with one bridge uh, expansion span. Uh, what I mean, if you have a continuous three span bridges, but you only have one fixed uh, support in the longitudinal direction, this is a one piece fixed, uh, one piece deck. So this uh, study is also applicable for this type of bridges. This, uh, this type, uh, this study could be adapted for bridges consists of succession of simply supported or continuous single piece decks. For example, if you have a succession of, for example, 10 span bridges, this also, uh, if it is simply supported with uh, certain expansion links, this study also could be adapted for it. Uh, then I've used in the sensitivity an alpha factor equal to one. After that, at the end of this study, I've uh, printed the charts like shown in the Annex G in your code. Uh, I used the same mentality or the same procedures used to produce the charts in the Eurocode Annex G, but I made them for an alpha factor higher than one. If you take a look on the Annex G, they give the charts for the track bridge interaction but they they only use alpha factor equal to one. I made it with alpha factor equal to 1.4 and this study will be uh, will be applicable for any loads or any classified vertical loads with an alpha factor up to 1.4. Why I made it? Because there are some countries using an alpha factor higher than one. For example, in Turkey, we are using 1.33 or 1.4, but, but as much as I remember, universally they, they will it's not certain yet, they will use a unified alpha factor equal to 1.33. Now, if I start that in my sensitivity analysis, I've used, uh, I've used some load cases which they are fixed. For example, I used the thermal load is uh, applied to the bridge deck is plus minus 35 degrees. Uh, the loads are uh, LM71 vertical load enhanced by the dynamic vac factor. And the vertical load is positioned on the bridge deck to provide maximum top deck displacement. It's one of the conditions that you have to satisfy. Your top deck displacement should be limited. Now I, I will try to show it. Your top deck displacement here uh, is limited to eight millimeters. You can, uh, this is one of the conditions. So you should have a, a bending stiffness, which will provide a top deck displacement under vertical load less than eight millimeters. Then after that, uh, I used uh, two ballast resistance, as I, as I have mentioned before, one for unloaded cases, which I will use it for the thermal case, then the loaded case, uh, the loaded stiffness or the loaded resistance, which I will use it for the uh, horizontal and vertical loads. Now models are consist of bridge deck and 100 meter impactment in the front of the uh, bridge deck and uh, behind the bridge deck. I've announced around 2000 cases and some I've choose some scenarios to show it to you. Now, if I will talk about the bridge mechanical properties, the parameters that affecting your track bridge interaction, I can start with the uh, I can start with the span lengths. Then the mechanical properties are bending stiffness, the deck height of your uh, the deck height of your bridge, the neutral axis location in your deck, and the deck cross section areas. What I've made that, uh, uh, I've changed only one per meter at a time. So that's why I, I only change one per meter and I'm trying to see how it's changing the rail stresses in, 
in the bridge. Now, if I, if we are talking about thermal action, now I plotted a chart showing uh, the rail stresses. It's for the same bridge, the same uh, uh, bending stiffness. Everything is the same. It's 60 meters long, but I've changed the longitude and the stiffness of the bridge. Uh, I've used uh, three uh, stiffnesses. Uh, substructure stiffness, it's two kilonewton uh, per millimeter per meter per, per one track. Then K5, it's five kilonewtons per millimeter per meter per, per track. And K20, 20 kilonewton per millimeter per meter per track. Then I started to plot the rail stresses, as you can see. Uh, as you can see, under thermal load, increasing the uh, substructure stiffness will increase the rail stresses because here the dashed one is the low stiffness and the thick one is the high stiffness. If we continue here, I, I again plotted the same, but for a 30 meters a bridge span, again, you can see here uh, the thick one is the high stiffness and the dashed line is the rail stresses for the lowest stiffness. Uh, then I made a kind of a radical uh, chart here. Here it's an 80 meters bridge span uh, under temperature fall load with two radical, uh, or how can I say, uh, two radical cases. The first one is extremely uh, fixed support. Uh, actually, the longitudinal stiffness of, of the bridge reach uh, its maximum. Then the other one is uh, uh, the zero stiffness one. As you can see, uh, lowering the stiffness or zero stiffness, this is not an actual case, but it's only for illustrating. Uh, you can see that uh, the stresses are lower than uh, the fixed one. The fixed one is the thick shot and the uh, dashed one is the uh, free to move bridge case. Now, I made the same shots. Uh, I plotted the rail stresses, but for different spans with two kilonewtons per meter per attack longitudinal stiffness. As you can see, while the bridge span uh, or expansion length increases, the rail stresses are increasing. The thickest one is the 20 meter span, as you can see from here, and it's increasing till it will reach the 90 meter span, this one. Then I, I made the same uh, shot, but with a 20 kilonewton per millimeter per track stiffness. You can see that th from the difference between the two shots that by increasing the longitudinal stiffness of the bridge, the rail stresses caused by uh, temperature uh, loads are increasing. Now, I, I've moved from the uh, temperature loads to horizontal loads. Now, I, I've taken a 50 meters span length bridge uh, with the same mechanical properties. Then I change it only the longitudinal stiffness of the bridge. Now, the thickest one is the lowest stiffness with uh, two kilonewton per millimeter per track. And this dashed one is the high stiffness. You can see from this chart that increasing the bridge longitudinal stiffness will decrease the uh, rail stresses. Now I made the, the same, uh, I made the same uh, chart, but for a 90 meters uh, bridge span length. And as you can see the same uh, thing happen. The low stiffness give a very high stresses, while the higher higher stiffness will reduce the rail stresses. Now I made this. Now I moved. I've plotted all of the uh, rail stresses under horizontal forces, but for different bridge uh, uh, bridge span lengths. As you can see, I started from 20 meters uh, length till 90 meters. Now we can see that increasing the span lengths will increase the, uh, the rail stresses. Uh, now I made the same thing, but with a higher longitudinal stiffness with five kilonewton per millimeter per track. And as you can see that increasing for the same, the mechanical properties are the same. The only difference is uh, the span length. You can see that span length is uh, changing and uh, the longitudinal stiffness between these two shots. So you can see that increasing the longitudinal stiffness will decrease uh, the rail stresses. Now, the same chart I plot, but for a higher 
longitudinal stiffness, 20 kilonewton per millimeter per, uh, per meter per tack. Then, then I was trying to see if does that bridge deck or bending stiffness or uh, that bridge uh, deck uh, height or the neutral axis location affecting the rail stresses under horizontal forces, you can see for a 20 meters bridge length with the, the same longitudinal stiffness with the same uh, with the same uh, uh, with different uh, bridge height uh, and uh, neutral axis location are giving actually the same uh, they are overlap they are giving actually the same uh, rail stresses but uh, also I've used uh, with the lower bending stiffness I've used and now a higher span length it's around 60 meters and as you can see they are also giving the same uh, rail stresses but now when I started when I started to change the bridge deck height uh, uh, when I started with a higher uh, longitudinal stiffness actually the longitudinal stiffness uh, higher longitudinal stiffness with different bridge deck height it's actually started to change the uh, track response and the track uh, uh, stresses. We, we saw that from the past previous chart that uh, with the low longitudinal stiffness, the stresses are not affected with the bridge deck height, but with higher longitudinal stiffness, they are started to affecting, uh, uh, uh, they start to affect the rail stresses. Now, if I continue with under vertical loads, it's the LM71 vertical load will induce some uh, stresses on our track. You can see that I've used now 60 meters span length with uh, longitudinal stiffness, with different longitudinal stiffness, uh, with the fixed deck high and neutral axis location. Now, I uh, now the uh, bridge bending stiffness I used to cause uh, it will result in two millimeter top, top deck displacement. This is the bending stiffness that I've used. Then, as you can see from the chart, that lower bend, uh, lower longitudinal stiffness are causing a lower layer, uh, rail stresses. While increasing the longitudinal stiffness, it will increase the rail stresses. Actually, actually the, the parameters are so many, and changing the uh, the permit, increasing the longitudinal stiffness. Uh, uh, it's uh, the response of the track stresses are not the same all the time. So, for example, if you are increasing the longitudinal stiffness uh, for vertical loads, it will increase the rail stresses, but for the horizontal loads, it will decrease the, uh, the rail stresses. In the same case, it's for thermal load, increasing the longitudinal stiffness will increase the rail stresses, while decreasing uh, the longitudinal stiffness will decrease the, the rail stresses. Now, I tried to, to plot uh, for uh, for vertical loads with uh, a fixed longitudinal stiffness two kilonewton per millimeter per track, and which will and with the bending stiffness which will result in two millimeter uh, top deck displacement with the deck height with a cylindricalness ratio equal to L over eight and the neutral axis location located at around ninety percent of the bridge height. Then I've changed the uh, then I've changed the span and I plot all of the rail stresses, you can see that uh, the tension stresses are nearly the same for all of the bridge, for all of the bridge uh, spans, while the compression is start to decreases uh, by increasing your uh, span length. The same thing, uh, the same plot I've, I've plotted, but with uh, 20 kilo Newton uh, per stiffness, per millimeter per track stiffness. Now you can see the two charts are identical. The only difference between the two cases is the longitudinal stiffness. And you can see that by, by this one is the two kilonewton and this is the 20 kilonewton per millimeter per meter per track. And you can see by increasing the longitudinal stiffness, the rail stresses are increased. Now I'm, now I uh, choose one span length, which is 60 meters I've, I'm showing here with two kilonewton uh, per millimeter per meter per track longitudinal stiffness. Now I've started to change the bending stiffness, but I've kept that bridge deck height 
constant and the neutral axis location constant. And you can see here from the plot that he, uh, the thickest one is causing around 0.33 top deck displacement. And, I go, um, and I'm increasing the top deck displacement gradually till I reach seven millimeters. Now you can see that in uh, the rail stresses and the top deck displacements are correlated and increasing the top deck displacement or in another word, decreasing the bridge bending stiffness will increase the top deck displacement and the rail stresses. Now I'm using the same 60 meter uh, with two kilo newton uh, per uh, with two kilo newton per millimeter per meter per attack on stiffness. Then I started to change with a fixed oh, I, also with a fixed uh, neutral axis location at 0 0.9 edge. Then I started to change the deck height and I am trying to track the real maximum tension stress. Now you can see by increasing the deck height the marine maximum tension stress is decreasing. This one is top deck displacement. Now, now by, by increasing, the, it, it, it is, uh, this, the thickest one is 7.5 meters. It's the highest bridge deck. This one is the shallowest deck. So by increasing the bridge deck height, the tension stresses are dropping. Now, the same case I, I plotted with the uh, with four compression stresses. So as you can see, compression stress also is dropping. The thickest one is the highest bridge de deck and the dashed one, the very dashed one is the shallowest deck. You can see that uh, the, the rail stresses are decreasing by increasing the bridge deck height. Now I'm using the same 60 meter, but now I fixed the bridge deck height. I started now to move the neutral axis location. And you can see by that a higher neutral axis location is increasing the stresses while a lower neutral axis location is decreasing the stresses. And this is, makes sense because a higher neutral axis will increase the top deck displacement on the top. The same case for the compression. And I, as I have mentioned, now it's different. A higher neutral axis will cause a lower compression stresses. So, at the end of this sensitivity analysis, I have the measurements to produce a new, uh, and I have the tools to produce a new uh, charts, like the charts in Annex G, and uh, for a higher alpha loads. Now, the charts that I'm going to show, they are identical to the charts in Eurocode in Annex G, but they are for an al classified loads with the alpha factor up to 1.4. The sections, if you have, uh, the sections are with, uh, with depths varying from L over A to L over 35. Uh, this study is valid for these sections with the neutral axis varying from 0.5 H to 0.95 H for, and also for bridges with the longitudinal stiffness ranges, ranges between two to 20 kilonewton per, per uh, kilonewton over millimeter per meter per track. And also for ballasted track with unloaded resistance equal to 20 kilonewton and loaded resistance equal to 60 kilonewton and bridge spans varying from 20 to 90 millimeters. Now, this is, uh, uh, this is the charts actually look like, the charts in the Annex G. Uh, I will describe what these charts means. Uh, I made uh, for uh, concrete and composite section and for steel sections. Now, what does this chart mean is that uh, if you have a bridge structure and for example, you have a 30, me uh, 30 meter bridge span. Now at the very, at the primarily design stage, uh, you, want to, you want to check that if your uh, bridge is okay with uh, track structure interaction, you have to change a kind of a section of your bridge. Now in a very, very simple calculation, you can uh, calculate the top, uh, the deck top displacement and what this chart give you that if for example for a 30 meter bridge span and you have calculated around two millimeter top deck displacement you will come to here and this three now let me describe these three lines this one are, are your longitudinal your uh, bridge substructure longitudinal stiffness now uh, 
the dashed one, the dashed one is representing that uh, 20 kilo newton per millimeter per tack uh, stiffness. Now the thick one is uh, the the thickest one is the two kilo newton per millimeter per tack uh, stiffness. Now this one, actually, the two kilo newton. This one, the five. This one is the 20. Now if you have if your substructure is around, for example, two kilo newton per millimeter per tack in the longitudinal stiffness, and your from the primarily designed calculations, you can calculate the deck top displacement from the bending stiffness of your bridge. And you have a 30 meter bridge span. You will come to that too. And you will try to hit it with the, your longitudinal stiffness. And you go to the maximum permissible expansion length. Now, as you can see here from two millimeter, we can understand that it's around 40 to 43 um, uh, meters, which means that if your bridge span is 30 meters, it's okay. You don't need actually to make a rail structure interaction calculations. You don't need to calculate your uh, additional rail stresses. Actually, I've made it for you. And the same as in the Annex G, but they made it for alpha equal to one. I made it for an alpha up to 1.4. For example, if you are using an alpha factor equal to 1.33, you don't have a, with these charts, you don't have to make a rail structure interaction. Now. Uh, especially uh, now the case it's only for one span uh, single uh, single deck bridges now you will you will calculate your top deck displacement then after that you will try to hit it with uh, with uh, your uh, substructure longitudinal stiffness and after that you will get your maximum per permissible expansion length for example uh, what i mean by uh, uh, the, what I mean by maximum permissible expansion length is the maximum bridge deck span allowed with this top deck displacement. After calculating, as I said, after calculating your top deck displacement, you can uh, just come to your uh, substructure longitudinal, uh, longitudinal stiffness. Then you you will see that uh, is it okay? If it's not okay, you may increase your uh, deck bridge deck stiffness, uh, bending stiffness. So you can lower your top deck displacement, which allow you with a higher spans, or you can increase the uh, substructure longitudinal stiffness. For structures. example, uh, for example, for the same bridge, for example, let's say that I want to make a 40 meters with the with the top deck displacement uh, results in three millimeter. Now, if we come to here, it's not allowed to do 40 meters by just increasing your your longitudinal uh, substructure longitudinal stiffness up to around 20 you can do you can use the, it's allowed you to do the 40 meters now if your substructure longitudinal stiffness is between 2 5 20 you can make a linear interpolation between these uh, charts now as a result of i say that increasing the bridge longitudinal stiffness will increase the stresses under thermal loads increasing the bridge span length will increase the stresses so this is the case for the thermal loads uh, as a conclusion uh, under horizontal for uh, low forces which i mean that braking or acceleration increasing the bridge longitudinal stiffness will decrease the stresses increasing the bridge span will increase the stresses increasing the bridge deck height will increase the stresses increasing the bridge neutral axis height from the bottom surface will increase their stresses increasing the bridge bending stresses will decrease the stresses now, under vertical loads, increasing the bridge longitudinal stiffness will increase the stresses. Increasing the bridge span length will increase also the stresses. Increasing the bridge bending stiffness will drop the stresses in the track. Increasing the bridge deck height increase the compression stresses and decrease the tension stresses. Increasing the bridge neutral axis height from the bottom surface will increase the tension stresses and decrease the compression stresses. Now, these are my references. Uh, thank you for listening, and if you have any question, I will be glad to answer it. Yes, any questions from the audience? Um, so, uh, Abdullah, I have one comment. Like, you sold for 1.4 alpha, and you know that it ranges between 1 and 1.4. So, can you also comment that... Uh, can you make a linear interpolation? Let's say if I have 1.2 as alpha, can I just look to graph of appendix G1 and then go to appendix your results 
is it linearly changing between these alphas, uh, this relationship? Somewhere yeah. you said some, something like that, I guess. Uh, actually, I tried to put uh, overlap the two shots. Actually, there, there might be a linear interpolation, but I didn't verify it. Okay. So That's why I didn't use it here. I tried to put the two shots over each other, overlap them. There isn't some linear interpolation, but I didn't verify it. That's why I didn't uh, add it. But it could be used, actually. So this, indeed, the Appendix G in Eurocode is a good tool for design engineers yes. to do a decision whether to do a reinstruction traction or not. Yes. Reinstruction traction takes time and there's too many components. Yes. And they just have for alpha one and you did for alpha 1.4. So all this analysis, like you did something around 2000 analysis. Yes. And it just gives a good idea. Yes. Actually, if, if your bridge is falling under this chart, you don't need to do a rail structural interaction. I've this, already did it for, did it for yeah, this, this is the whole point. Yes. yes. So it is just for the future. For yes. people who want to use it, yes. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, the next speaker will be uh, uh, Tolga Onal. And uh, you can start sharing, Tolga. Sesim geliyor mu hocam? Yes, we can hear you, Tolga. Teşekkür ederim. Tam ekranı almak istiyorum. Yalnız şey yapamıyorum. Onu bir e, F5. Cetvelin yanında, sağ, solunda hemen. Aşağıda bir yüzde 83 gibi bir şey yazıyor. Onun solundaki ikon. E, ha, buradan. Sağında değil de solunda. Evet, o tam o değil. Onun yanındaki sandı. Evet, o, evet. Ha, ben e, F5'i kullanmıştım. E, genelde onu kullanıyorum. Şimdi o F5 çalışmadı. Hı. Teşekkür ederim. Sağ olun. E, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Tolga Önal from Kavakin. Today we will try to uh, make a presentation about aluminum magnesium plasma arc thermal spray used in long-term anti-corrosion protection of bridge bearings in high, harsh environments. Corrosion of bearings is a major factor affecting the safety and serviceability of bridges. The uh, bridge bearings are usually located in areas that are poorly ventilated and has the potential to collect moisture, debris, water, and as can be seen on the photos, these factors lead to uh, harsh, uh, the heavy, heavy corrosion problems. In addition, bridge bearings located in uh, coastal areas, marine environments, which is a common case, uh, has the high potential risk of corrosion and uh, the salt salt air uh, can uh, accelerate the corrosion of steel and even within 20 years we can see such damages uh, on the bridge bearings as seen on the photos it seems reliable anti-corrosion methods are necessary in order to ensure the serviceability of bridge bearings and bridges during a long life cycle with minimal maintenance. In order to avoid the corrosion of steel surfaces, paint coatings and a similar type of it, a heavy duty uh, coatings are commonly used. 
But in pain coatings, in case of pain coatings, the protective layer is degraded due to its exposure to wet and dry cycles of direct sunlight and rainwater. And in painted structures, rust starts in areas where the coating has been damaged, exposing the steel surface. This is because paint coating only provides a protective layer. That's why technologies have been developed for sacrificial protection. In sacrificial protection, steel surface is coated with another metal, which is easier to be corroded compared to steel or let's say iron. Hot tip galvanizing and thermal spraying, uh, which is an advanced technology compared to hot tip galvanizing, are two examples of sacrificial protection. The corrosion of iron starts uh, when iron in the outermost layer of the steel surface uh, contacts with water. And when iron contacts with water, it loses some electrons and forms positively charged iron ions. And when oxygen and water uh, reacts with the electrons, they form negatively charged uh, hydroxide ions. And when this positively charged iron and negatively charged hydroxide ions combine, they form iron dehydroxide, which is rust. And this rust uh, accumulated on the surface is a porous layer, it has a pore protection capacity that it lets water and oxygen go through it. And as long as water and oxygen is present, is provided, it goes through it and the oxidation process continues within the steel. However, in case we uh, coat the steel layer with another metal, which has a high tendency to ionize compared to iron, like zinc, in case of hot dip galvanization, um, this zinc layer um, reacts much more rapidly compared to iron. Uh, as in the previous case, in iron case, the zinc uh, reacts with oxygen and water and forms zinc dehydroxide. And in case there's a crack or physical damage on the coating, this zinc uh, dehydroxide uh, forms a layer, uh, covers the opening, uh, forms a layer, and this layer is uh, stable compared to iron dehydroxide. Uh, and uh, has a stable protection capacity. It doesn't let water and oxygen go through it. And as it is, uh, it reacts much more rapidly compared to iron, it's, a, it's called sacrificial protection. This table classifies the metals uh, based on its, their tendency to lose electrons, or to, in other words, to te their tendency to ionize compared to iron. The metals on the left side of iron has the tendency to ionize, and that's why they can be used as coating materials. The uh, metals with the most uh, ten uh, ionization tendency are uh, potassium, calcium and sodium, but uh, these uh, three metals react rapidly with water and it, uh, it is unpractical to use them as coating mater metals, materials. That's why the other metals are used for coating like chromium, zinc, manganese, aluminium and magnesium. Aluminium and magnesium has a very good protection capacity, but due to their high melting points, they cannot be used in hot dip galvanizing. And zinc is uh, generally used for hot dip galvanizing. But we want to use, we wish to use magnesium and aluminum for coating. In order to make use of the excellent anti-corrosion protection characteristics of aluminum and magnesium, we propose plasma arc thermal spraying. In plasma thermal spraying process, 
aluminum magnesium alloy material, this is uh, aluminum magnesium wire, is melted by plasma gas and electric arc and projected to the steel surface to be coated. The melted material is sprayed to the surface and the spray temperature is less than 100 degrees Celsius. Various metals can be used, sprayed uh, with this technique, including zinc, uh, besides aluminum and magnesium. But as the spray temperature is not so high, aluminum and magnesium is, are preferred. And plasma thermal spraying methods can be used in various surfaces like surfaces of bearings, expansion joints, and even high strength bolts because of the temperature is not high. Uh, in order to evaluate and compare the uh, performance, anti-corrosion performances of uh, various coating materials, uh, we concluded accelerated corrosion test with salt spray uh, um, simulating the marine environment. The test is based on automotive material corrosion test method, JASO, Japanese Automotive Standards Organization. One cycle is consists of salt water spraying at 35 degrees Celsius for two hours, heat drying at 60 degrees for four hours, and wetting at 50 degrees for two hours. One cycle takes eight hours and the test, whole test, uh, continued for 6,000 hours, which uh, that is nine months and that makes uh, 750 cycles. The test specimens are coated with uh, four types of coatings, fluorine resin paint coating, zinc hot dip galvanized coating, zinc aluminum thermal spread coating, and aluminum magnesium plasma thermal spread coating that we propose. Uh, a scratch, a cross cut is applied on the test pieces to simulate the physical damage on the coating. After 1,500 hours, uh, rust was observed on the cross cut uh, of the pieces coated with fluorine resin paint coating. The paint coating is good for uh, coating the whole surface, has a good uh, performance, but it does not has a, have a good performance for uh, physical damages. In case of hot dip galvanized coating, the cross cut area is covered with the coating material as it is a sacrificial protection. However, on the, on the whole surface, rust corrosion was observed after 1,500 hours of testing. That um, corresponds to represents 35 years of, of uh, the steel uh, member. Uh, prone to marine environment. The test is uh, accelerated test uh, 200 times accelerated compared to the actual time. And we can check the status of the uh, coating materials after 70 years and for 140 years time. In case of zinc aluminum thermal spray coating, the cross cut area is covered with the coating material, but uh, rust was observed a little later compared to hot dip galvanization, uh, represent 70 years. In aluminum magnesium plasma thermal spray coating, the cross cut is covered with the coating material and, uh, and the uh, coating showed a very stable, good performance during the whole test, representing 140 years. And no rust was observed. 
The test was performed for plate-like specimens, but bridge bearings have complex shapes, so it is necessary to carry out similar tests on these uh, complicated structures to see the shape uh, effects, shape factors for the uh, performance of the coating materials. In order to achieve this, we um, uh, use rubber bearing test specimens for the accelerated corrosion test. Two tanks and a dry warehouse were used for the wet and dry uh, cycles of the specimens, salting, drying, wetting, and three types of coating were uh, checked. Zinc thermal spread coating, aluminum thermal spread coating, and aluminum magnesium plasma arc thermal spread coating. Uh, in case of zinc coating, rust appeared on the surface and was rapidly developed. In case of the test specimens coated with aluminium, that is a high tendency to ionize compared to zinc, corroded but in a lower extent. In case of aluminium magnesium coating, we saw some traces of rust, but actually this rust is not developed on the test pieces. This rust actually uh, developed on other test pieces and remained in the, the tank and adhered to the, the specimens when these specimens were uh, dipped in the tank for testing. So actually no rust was developed on these test pieces and this tests for bridge bearings also showed us the stability and the performance of protection capability of aluminum magnesium coating. At the conclusion, different anti-corrosion protection methods are tested, paint coating, hot tip galvanizing, zinc thermal spray, aluminum thermal spray, zinc aluminum thermal spray, aluminum magnesium plasma thermal spray that we proposed, the test simulated harsh environmental conditions like marine environment conditions and the test simulated actual components of bridge bearings. We confirmed stable and long-term protection capability of aluminum magnesium plasma thermal spray coating that can be evaluated as uh, providing a durability more than 100 years. This ends up the, our presentation. Thank you for Hocam bu arada mute gözüküyor sizi. Bilmiyorum. Sorry. Uh, I was I muted myself I guess. Uh, I'm just checking if there's question and answer. And uh, I, I have one question to you, Tolga. Yes. Mm. On this picture, like you have one bearing with some rust and then there's a sprayed one. And like, if you want to spray an existing one, is it possible? Like, because uh, looks like you are talking only about a product that will be sprayed before installation. Uh, that's my, my, one of my questions. And mm. the second question is, let's say during installation, there's a scratch. You think mm. there's, there's not going to be a problem like epoxy coating because epoxy coating has a big problem of uh, scratches, vulnerability. These are the two questions that I want to ask you. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, for, Yes, it can be applied for the existing bridge bearings. It can be used for maintenance. Okay, so it, but the surface needs to be cleaned, I guess. Yes, there are some procedures to clean, yes, clean the surface, to prepare for... Uh, the sur uh, surface actually is uh, very well... It should be very well prepared yes. for this process. And uh, 
Uh, sorry, I couldn't get your second, yeah, second question, question clearly. For, yes. Uh, yes, the second question is, let's say, during installation of yes. the new bearing, somebody scratched the hmm. paint or the spray, and there's a, like, the one you showed, like an X mark, so it mm -hmm. is yes. an unprotected. The, the problem with the epoxy coating, like for rebars, is they take the rebars and mm -hmm. they install at the side these green rebars, perhaps you have seen them, and mm -hmm. then somebody just scratches them, and then all mm -hmm. of a sudden the rust concentrates on the uh, unprotected area. Yeah. So, do you think that this one will have the same, or if somebody sprays later on, the problem will be solved? Basically, yeah, if there is a, a physical damage, uh, actually it's, yeah, it, it has the, that because of sacrificial protection, it is uh, supposed that it will uh, recover yes. itself. But if the scratch is very heavy, maybe it's yes. necessary to spray that again. part yes. again with, yeah, yes. It looks like it is easy to spray, like from what you are saying. It, can it be done at the site, the spraying business? Yeah, it's possible. It's possible to all the There are uh, small uh, uh, equipment for it to use on site. Okay, Different so available. Yes. Yes. Yes. That, that's my question. Thank you, Olga, for this good presentation. And uh, I think the next speaker is Elif Yildirim. Elif. Can you hear me? Uh, I can hear you. Yes. Uh, and uh, you can start sharing your screen, Elif, and start the presentation. Mm -hmm. um, wait a second, please. Um, I'm sorry. Oh, wait a second. Wait. Share screen. And, and do you see my screen? We, we can see your screen, Elif. Okay. Then I will. I am starting now. Uh, thank you for inviting us to share our study with you at Istanbul Bridge Conference. I wish we could meet in Istanbul, but I hope we will for the next event. I would like to thank Dr. Abjanar for hosting this great event as well. And now I will present you an analysis procedure of an example seismically isolated horizontal curved bridge and Turkish earthquake code for roadway and railway bridges and the code for bridges with seismic isolation and dampers has been published separately in October uh, 2020. These new codes are the first Turkish earthquake codes for bridges. Those will be mandatory beginning from, from next year. In this study, we will follow the code for bridges with seismic isolation. We applied this new code to an example seismically isolated horizontal curve bridge located in Istanbul. You can see here plan view and cross section of the considered bridge. This bridge has post tensioned cast in place box, box girder superstructure supported on reinforced concrete columns. This bridge has three spans. Total length of the bridge is approximately 110 meters. The challenging issue of this bridge is the roadway alignment is sharply horizontally curved. The angle between the two border radius lines of the curvature is 70 degree. 70 degree. And the bridge has totally eight isolators, two isolators on each pier and the abutments. Turkish earthquake code, uh, code for isolated bridge says that all isolated bridges shall have immediate occupancy performance level under DD1 ground motion level. The DD1 ground motion level means a very rare earthquake with a probability of exceedance of 2% in 50 years with a return period of 2,475 years. Therefore, DD1 ground motion 
in Grand Marshall level with the return period of 2,475 years is the design earthquake for seismically isolated bridges. On the right side, you can see the elastic design the spectrum for the site class of C. Spectral ordinates are provided from seismic hazard map of Turkey. Short period design spectral acceleration and one second period spectral acceleration values are cal calculated using site class coefficients. Since this bridge is supported with eight uh, lead rubber bearings, I would like to mention the advantages to use isolators and materials used in lead rubber bearings for participants who are not related with that. Lead rubber bearings are comprised of a number of rubber layers and thin steel plates as shown in the figure. Rubber material provides lateral flexibility. Using LRB increases the natural period of the system with the help of lateral flexibility. This directly reduces earthquake forces. In addition to this, isolators provide energy dissipation mechanism to reduce displacement. Inner steel plates provide vertical stability, uh, which is needed to support axial loads. It is our three-dimensional three finite element model of the curvature, curved uh, bridge. This bridge is modeled in sub-2000. This um, bridge stack is modeled using shell elements and C40 concrete material is used. 50% of the gross uh, section stiffness was used for in-plane and out-of-plane bending and shear behavior. Columns are uh, columns are modeled with frame elements and C30 concrete material is used. LRVs are modeled with the nonlinear link elements. Rigid elements are used to link the deck to bearings and columns. Soil structure interaction isn't considered in this study. F uh, fixed base foundation is assumed. Here we see uh, the cross section of the column that has uh, one, uh, one and a half meter diameter. Longitudinal reinforcement is assumed as 1% of gross area of the section. Confined concrete model is considered for the section core. And the new code uh, do not provide a specific effective stif stiffness factor for the columns. Using a moment curvature relationship of the section, uh, considering axial load, 30% of gr uh, gross section stiffness is used for the effective bending stiffness uh, of the columns. No stiffness reduction is made in shear and axial stiffness of the column, column elements. 20% of the gross stiffness is taken as effective torsional stiffness. Lead rubber bearings used in this study are modeled with nonlinear link elements. To define nonlinear behavior of LRB, sub 2000 needs initial elastic stiffness yields force and the ratio of post elastic to initial st stiffness uh, of LRB. <coughs> Sorry. According to the new code, all analysis for isolated bridges should be performed using both underbound and lower bound characteristics of LRV. Therefore, coefficients of lower bound analysis and upper bound analysis were, were determined for characteristic strength and post elastic stiffness using the tables in the code. Here we see low, lower bound analysis coefficients in the slide. <coughs> Sorry. Here we see the tables in the code to achieve upper bound analysis coefficients. The new code uh, has bridge classifications. I don't want to go into details of the bridge class descriptions. Shortly, this bridge is in the normal bridge class among bridge importance classes. And excuse me. And secondly, this bridge is a complex bridge according to structural analysis method selection classification due to its sharp horizontal curve. 
This table shows that nonlinear time steering analysis shall be performed for uh, isolated bridges according to the new code. Here, the database is used to choose ground motion records that are compatible with design spectrum. This, ta this table lists the records used in the analysis. Seven sets of ground motion records are processed for filter filtering and scaling. Then nonlinear dynamic analysis were performed in two directions separately for seven scaled ground motion data set, which means 14 records. 14 analysis using upper bound and 14 analysis using um, lower bound characteristics or LRB of LRB uh, were performed. The average uh, response spectrum of scaled ground motion records cannot be less than elastic design spectrum at the period of 0.75 T and uh, 1.25 T. Time step for the time analysis, time history analysis, was chosen as equal to the time step of each record. Those force and displacements cannot be less than 9% of those obtained from response spectrum analysis. And design forces and displacements are calculated as the average of the absolute maximum values of the results obtained from each of the analysis. These plots show isolator displacement time and isolator force displacement for a record of Hector mine earthquake. And the code gives displacement amplification factors specific to the bridge classes. Here we need to amplify seismic displacement obtained from analysis with uh, 1.1 and 1.05. Total dis design displacement is calculated adding service displacement for a seismic case to amplified seismic displacement. For LRB design, we are doing many checks, but shear strain limit checks and vertical load stability checks are very essential, and these directly affect isolator design. Shear strain is the ratio of demand displacement over the total rubber thickness. The new code specifies shear strain limits considering service displacements and seismic displacements. According to the code, gamma can be 2.25 uh, for our considered bridge. It means shear strain caused by amplified se seismic displacement can be 2.25 times of total rubber thickness of LRB. Vertical, vertical stability of LRB is checked for under deformed and deformed state separately. It proves that LRB can carry the vertical load in deformed state under axial loads in seismic case. And also LRB can carry total of dead and line loads at under deformed, undeformed state with safety factor of three. Getting seismic displacement from the analysis and checks specified in the code, <coughs> we concluded that the design shown in this table. This LRB has 800 millim uh, millimeter diameter and 206 millimeter height. Total rubber, uh, total rubber height is 130 millimeter. Actually, two types of LRB could be selected for piers and abutments. However, one type of LRB is selected for all isolators prototype because of prototype test cost. And these two isolators for each type shall be tested according to the code. We prepared a table for prototype and factor production test protocol according to the code. Uh, here, basically, we are starting with thermal displacement wind load and breaking load tests. Then we are doing seismic tests and repeat it one more time. After all this, we check, we check the behavior uh, under wind load and breaking load after seismic event tests. The, uh, this test protocol end up with stability check tests 
at amplified seismic displacement. And uh, factory production control tests uh, are performed for all bearings um, uh, for uh, to check compression capacity and horizontal characteristics under cyclic deformation, uh, under the vertical load of dead load uh, and live load. <coughs> Here you see um, uh, pictures from the uh, test centers uh, that can uh, that we we can use uh, isolator uh, isolators to be tested. Uh, type tests shall be performed in independent, uh, independent accredited labs or university labs calibra calibrated by accredited institutions. Um, how we choose a uh, test center is um, can change uh, according to the av availability of test center, capacity of test machine, and uh, sample size and transportation and testing costs. Uh, here you see uh, 150 shear strain tree cycle tests uh, as an example. And here uh, we will see 10 cycle tests uh, under 100% 100, uh, 100 shear strain tests. On the right side, uh, we see a um, force displacement curve of the isolators uh, when, when this test is performed. Thank you very much for uh, listening to me. Thanks, Elif. Are, are there any questions from the audience to Elif? Let me see. Elif, I think I, I will ask a question uh, to you. Uh, about the design, someone who said that the lead core has a 200 millimeter diameter. The, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. And, um, Back to and the, the, the radius, uh, the diameter of the uh, bearing is 800 millimeters. Do you think this is a good ratio? Because I remember seeing less core radius before. Do you think this is due to the new code requirements or do you think it is just the usual design? Because to have your ratio is about 25% of the diam uh, diameter. Mm -hmm. And I know that people can use less. Is this due to the new code requirement? This change mm -hmm. in design? Like looks kind of expensive. Mm. Uh, it can be reduced, but uh, it, it is just a preliminary, preliminary design, uh, actually, and uh, it can be reduced, but uh, we design it uh, because of, uh, to get uh, damping uh, from the lead core. So this is an op optimum design, or do you think there's some engineering um, tolerance, like over no, we, have, we, have, we have some tolerance. Okay. And one other thing about uh, upper and lower limits, like in the recent earthquake in Malatya, Tivrije, there was a, a hospital, uh, Elazığ Hospital, and the designers were objecting to the upper bound and lower bound limits of the code mm -hmm. and of the building code. So is this the same? Are they following the same limits? In the new code? Uh, are you asking uh, these uh, coefficients are the same as the, with the building code? Yes. Um, actually, okay. no, not exactly. Okay, so there's a difference. I hope they improved something because uh, even the designer was upset in Elizabeth. That's what I remember about the code requirements. All right, Th that's all I last. Thank you, Elif, for Thank this nice Thank you very time. much. Thank you. And uh, I'll give the floor to John. Yes, yes.
Sansu is there. Uh, uh, welcome again, dear attendants. Now we will have a commercial break uh, up till 11.05 or 11.05 a.m. And we will be together after that commercial break for the second session of today, which will be about joints and bearings. Thank you and please bear with us.
Bridgewitz has been established in New York and expanded to the capital of Turkey, Ankara. As Bridgewitz, we provide reliable and affordable engineering services. Our workforce has more than 70% women in the team. Consulting and optimization, detailed evaluation of joints and bearings, condition assessment and health monitoring, and bridge engineering IT support are the provided services of the company. Bridgewise Engineering is also a research and development company in the technopolis of one of the top universities on Turkey, which researching joints, bearings and artificial intelligence-based bridge management systems. At the same time, Bridgewise supplies educational and engineering tools through tutorials and smart Bridgewise calculators. As BridgeWiz, we can provide custom tools for your company in the forms of mobile or personal computer application.
Biz Türkiye'nin ilk ve tek yerli ve milli deprem izolatörü. Dünyada kullanılan en son teknoloji en yeni deprem yalıtımı sistemi. Hastaneler, veri merkezleri, konutlar, köprüler, okullar, iş ve alışveriş merkezleri, hatta tarihi yapılar, üst yapıyla temel arasına yerleştirilen pis deprem izolatörleriyle şimdi daha güvenli, şimdi daha sağlam. TİS Teknolojik İzolatör Sistemleri Yapılara güç katar, hayatlara güven verir. Reinforced concrete is one of the most economical and durable construction materials on the planet. When properly designed and maintained, concrete structures can last hundreds of years. There are times when it makes sense to demolish and rebuild structures, but all too often, the service life of a structure is unnecessarily cut short due to the widespread effects of corrosion and deterioration. In the construction industry, extending the service life and preserving concrete structures is the most economical and sustainable activity that we can pursue. Proper maintenance and periodic cleaning are simple and cost-effective activities that defer the requirement for major concrete restoration. Preserving or reusing existing infrastructure is one of the most sustainable activities that facility management can implement by mitigating pollution, reducing solid waste, and conserving natural resources. Concrete Preservation Alliance consists of Vector Construction, Vector Corrosion Technologies, Vector Corrosion Services, and NDT Corporation. These four businesses have come together to create an informational website to promote sustainable practices in the construction industry. We hope the website will become a leading resource of information for owners and engineers who are interested in concrete preservation practices. We invite you to explore the pages of WeSafeStructures.info where you will learn about the benefits of concrete and corrosion evaluations, concrete repair techniques, and extending the life of corroding structures using coatings, overlays, cathodic protection, and other techniques. Please contact the Concrete Preservation Alliance or visit WeSafeStructures.info for more information.